Matthew chapter 25. The page number is 994 on the English Bible. Today's reading is Matthew chapter 25, page 994. Matthew chapter 25. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The first ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both, of, both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. They were on their way to buy the oil. The bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went out went with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey. Who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought, other, brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with, his, with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have been take will be taken from them. And throw, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you 
since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was ill, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothes you? When did we see you ill or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you do, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was ill and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or ill, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ola Tunde Jurowuju, um, but of course you can call me Tunde. Um, before I start, can we just uh, bow our heads and, and say a quick prayer? <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Thank you for our lives. Thank you for the community, for the brotherhood and the sisterhood, Lord, that we share with each other. Lord, we come to you this morning. We want to learn of you. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to hear you and that you'll transform our lives. This we ask for, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, so, it's lovely to see everyone this morning. Um, my script actually says it's lovely to see all this wonderful attire, but I can see we're all just sort of dressed regularly. <laughs> um, so I'll still say it anyway. Yeah, it's lovely to see, you know, uh, for those uh, who are wearing, you know, colorful clothes. Now, being an international service, I'm, I myself, you know, I'm, I'm dressed in what you call a, a buba, okay? A buba and shokoto. Um, my daughter saw me this morning for the first time. I don't think she's ever seen me in this sort of um, um, clothes. And, and she said, oh, why are you wearing a Nigerian pajamas? <laughs> and then I came into church also this morning. Yeah, you know, the first thing Jack said was, you know, lovely pajamas. And I'm thinking, well, what's, what's going on here? Um, for those who care to know, all right, this is what you typically wear to church. Sometimes you can even wear it to wedding ceremony, you know. Of course, the material might be different, you know. Um, uh, but sometimes we wear this at home as well, okay? Yeah, it's a pajamas. <laughs> but who cares? Okay. Um, so, today's a special day. We're celebrating the various cultures. Um, and the diversity within our church. I mean, it's brilliant to see. I mean, we've been singing a lot of songs in, you know, uh, in French, in you know, Spanish, and also in, in, in Japanese. And it's always beautiful to see. Now, I wouldn't give the sermon in English and then do it all over again in Yoruba, so I'll spare you that. So I'm just gonna do the sermon in, um, in English. So we're all praising God, we're all worshiping God under the same roof. And as we will see in today's passage, the nations will be gathered before the king on judgment day. And all he sees are two kinds of people, the righteous and the wicked. That's all that matters to God. 
So we might all be from different parts of the world, but all one in Christ. So whether you're a foreigner or a citizen of this country, in God's eyes, we are all the same. Therefore, we need to treat each other as though we are brothers and sisters. So we may come from different cultures, but we have a unifying culture in Christ. Now, Cambridge Dictionary, of course, defines culture as uh, a way of life, uh, an attitude or behavior uh, or opinion of a particular group of people, more like a, a way of being. I suppose what I would like to talk about today is that sort of unifying culture uh, that we all share in Christ, our way of being in Christ. So if we call today's uh, sermon the practicalities of, of being in Christ, I think that would be very appropriate. So before I go any further, can I just very quickly confess two things and apologize for those two things. One, I'm not here um, as somebody who has sort of figured it all out, okay? I'm, I'm still trying, all right? I get it wrong. I'm still figuring things out. So what I'm going to be saying today is a conviction for myself, all right? So it's not just me talking to you and telling you, you know, what to, to do. Secondly, um, you might leave here with more questions than you came here for. I have a tendency to, to do this because I'm an academic. If you ask my students, you know, they never understand what I'm saying, all right? And that's why I always say, go back and read, okay? Um, so apologies uh, for that. And, and, and again, the reason why I say that is... Um, Usually when I talk, I, it's like I'm pondering out loud, all right? so, so just, just bear with me. So you might not get what I'm trying to say, or you might then have a question. Um, but of course, Mo is always there to answer any questions, so <laughs> I volunteered Mo for that. And any other um, church um, elders, please talk to them. Um, so don't take everything that I'm going to be saying today right, at face value. Always hold it up against the word of God and let that be your guide. Um, and in fact, that's what we should be doing. All right? Don't just take everything that you're told. All right? Hook, line, and sinker. Always hold it up against the word of God. So I grew up in... Um, sorry, this is not working. Oh, sorry. So I grew up in Western Nigeria, all right? As you can see in that picture, um, instinctively, all right, uh, without even thinking about it, um, you will bow, you know, when you meet somebody who's older than you, all right? Because if you want to greet them, you have to bow, okay? Um, and if you want to do it in the traditional sense, if you're a male, you're going to be prostrating, you're going to be on the floor. All right? If you're a female, you'll be on your knees. So when, you're, when you see somebody who's much older than you, you'll go, you know, good morning or good afternoon or whatever it is. If you're a, a lady, you, you sort of, oh, sorry, sort of, you kneel down. So that is the culture. In the same manner, sometimes, you know, when the music breaks out, you know, don't be surprised to see people dancing, you know, because that's just part of who we are. In fact, other tribes in Nigeria will refer to our part of Nigeria, the, o, the Owambe people, means you know, people who, who, you know, who are full of life. And that's part of you know, who we are. We just do it instinctively. We don't even think about it. It's the, it's the Western Nigeria culture, and that is our way of being. Also in this culture, when you're addressing somebody who's much older than you, you don't address them by their names. You always attach something to it. So if you're, if you're addressing a male, you say uncle, all right? Or you say brother, okay? If you're addressing a female, you always say auntie or auntie. Yeah, maybe there's no difference there, but yeah. <laughs> so you have to add that to their name. In fact, sometimes we avoid their names altogether and we just use sir and we use ma, okay? So when I came to this country, of course, imagine my surprise, um, I quickly realized that none of this mattered. I didn't have to use sir or ma. I didn't have to use auntie or uncle or, or, or brother or, or sister. So now I call people older than my parents even by their first name. For me, it first felt out of place. But with time, today, I've lived here for so long, I don't even flinch 
anymore. I'm like Tony Montana, you know, in Scarface, shooting from the hip, saying, say hello to my little friend. <laughs> so I'm just dropping first names, right, left, center, you know. I just go, hey, Greg, or hi, Judith. Not minding that Greg or Judith could possibly be older than my parents. Well, if only my parents could see me now, yeah? <laughs> of course, I say this in jest. But the reality is the culture we accept or we assimilate into makes us behave instinctively in certain ways. You don't even realize what you're doing or that you're actually doing it because it's so natural to you. It's second nature. Now, Matthew 25 illustrates some practicalities of that Christian culture that we're going to be looking at, which is the Christian way of being. Uh, and we can easily miss it if we don't pay attention to it. So we see three sections here. The first one is the parable of the ten virgins. The second one is the parable of the three servants and the bags of gold. And then the third one is the description of the last judgment. Now, these three sections help, you know, help us to understand the nuanced aspect of the Christian way of being. And this makes all the difference in the world. You know, these are things that you know, God sees things that differentiates the good from the bad, the righteous from the wicked, the wise from the foolish, the blessed from the cursed. And it's important that we recognize these as well. So if you would indulge me, let's start with the um, last section, which is the description of the last um, judgment. So here, verse 31 to 46, we see the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels, of course, with him, and he will sit on the glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people, you know, one from another, as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. Now, I find this expression very interesting, separate people one from another. For me, it shows that there are two kinds of people here, okay? Uh, they are distinct. All right, in the aspects that matter to God. And of course, until this point, it felt like it wasn't clear what that difference between the two were. Now, these people themselves might not even know that there are any clear differences between them uh, because they've coexisted for quite some time now, but they operated under different ways of them being. But they, they are within the same community. So one had their being in Christ, and the other had their being outside of Christ. And of course, we know this to be, uh, to be true because Matthew 7 says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, all right, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who do the will, or who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So the fact that someone claims to be a Christian, the fact that somebody probably goes to church, that does not mean that they have their being in Christ. This is something we need to be very mindful of as professing Christians. Now, when you read verse 37, sorry, when you read verse 37 and 44, there is also this distinct sense of awareness between these two groups. You know, the king was telling them, you know, for I, I was hungry, you gave me something to eat, I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me, I needed clothes and you clothed me. But both groups were not aware, okay? One did not know that they had done it. The other group did not know that they had not done it. And they both asked the same question. When did we see you? When did we see you hungry? When did we see you in prison? When did we see you sick? And this brings Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2 to mind, you know, because when Hebrews said, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, people have um, shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. It says, do not forget. So look, it seems like sometimes we do forget. It's a very important instruction that Paul gave the Hebrews. It is a do in the Hebrews, it is easy to forget that this is important. You might miss it if you don't keep it in mind. It's that sort of nuanced part of our Christian culture, but one that is critical all the same. So being in Christ 
means showing hospitality. Now, when we see it, we do see it very clearly in Jesus' response in Matthew 25, verse 40, when he said, said, whatever you did for one of the least brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So when you look closely at these two groups, what you see is, again, they probably had the same expectations. They thought that they were going to be accepted. But it, it turns out that one group, the righteous, was doing what was required without even knowing that they were doing it. And the other group was not. So for the one group, the righteous group, could it be that they were doing the right thing, that doing the right thing became a second nature to them? And that they thought, and, and that what they thought was insignificant gesture was in fact something that was greatly pleasant to God, something that greatly pleased God. Or for the wicked group, does it mean that they forgot to show hospitality, as Paul encouraged us not to? Or could it be that they, they directed their hospitality to people who didn't really require it? Or maybe they had a selfish agenda. And we know Luke 6, 33 says that, you know, if you do good to those who are good to you, then what credit is that to you? So the interesting thing that I see here is verse 31 to 44 is actually a record of a time in the future. Jesus Christ is telling them that this is what is going to happen in the future. This is the conversation that I'll be having with these two groups in the future. So what this tells me basically is that these people in the future is us. Jesus is going to be having this conversation with us in the future. But then the question is, you're sat here today, you are, you are aware of Matthew 25. You've read it, I'm sure, several times. And yet, in the future, we'll be having the same conversation with, with God. What gives? I'll leave you to ponder on that for a bit. So these groups, okay, us, all right, we know what is important to God, yet the account we see here is we either forgot or we ignored it. Or it became second nature to us that we don't even realize that we're doing it. And I believe this is what Jesus Christ has been encouraging us throughout this mess throughout his messaging. When he said in Matthew 6, 3, he says, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So for your left hand not to know what your right hand is doing, it means that you have to give. And as you give, you don't dwell on it to make yourself feel better. Or you don't even give it a second thought. It means that you need to immediately forget that you don't have a great thing. And we have to remember that hospitality, which is doing good, for the benefit of others, is the most profound expression of love. And Jesus Christ taught us that. If you remember the two most important commandments that Jesus Christ gave us, which is love God and love your neighbor. And in the account of Matthew 25, verse 31 to 40 here, we see that nuanced expression of that love, the agape kind of love, a love that loves naturally without even knowing without even knowing that it is doing so. The bow was not set too high, so whatever you do, all right? Jesus Christ said, whatever you did for the list, however insignificant, all right? So my encouragement to us this morning is that we need to show hospitality, no matter how little or insignificant we might think it is. We do good because we are good. We don't do good to become good, all right? Matthew 12, 33 says, make the tree good and its fruit will be good. So it's all about the being. The doing will come naturally. A picture here, well, I developed that, I got that from an AI. Um, I just typed in a description and there's this wonderful software nowadays, you know, DAL-E. It will just, you type in a description and it will just create an image for you. And I did that with this. Um, and this basically um, represents growing up. So when I was very little, I would, you know, stare into my father's plate. And you know, in the Nigerian society, you have to respect your elders, you have to respect your father. Your father is the head of the house. So deference is always given to your father. So I 
would look at his plate and I would be like, wow, what size of meat is that? <laughs> because compared to the meat that we receive, ours is usually very small. So when you look in our pots of soup, all right, there are two sizes there, all right? One for the kids, one for the parents, and my dad especially. And I would look at it and be like, wow, this man is eating a big meat. <laughs> and then, as a little boy, I, I had a vision, I had a dream, you know, when I grew up. <laughs> I will have the biggest meat in the pot, yeah, right? you know. People will defer to me because I'll be the head of the household. So, of course, a dream was formed, something to aspire towards. Now, fast forward several years. I'm settled in the UK. I'm married to Pretty. We've got two kids, and you look into our curry soup, a curry pot, same meat sizes. <laughs> ah, I'm thinking, ah, <laughs> nope, <laughs> I don't think uh, that's supposed to happen. And then I come back from work, very tired. The last snacks in the cupboard, oh, yes, I've been very busy today, you know, I've brought home the bacon. Ah. I deserve this last piece of snack. But of course, the boss at home will say, no, 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 leave that for the kids. <laughs> I can't win. What's, what's happening here? So a boy's dream was just shattered like that. And that was because I moved to the UK. <laughs> so thank you, UK culture. And of course, a hint of uh, Indian culture as well. But well, before you feel bad for me, all right, there's also an aspect of the Nigerian culture where, or the Western Nigerian culture where, the parents would sell everything they own, if they had to, all right, to provide quality education for the kids. And in fact, my parents did that. So as a UK culture, I ain't selling my house oh. to educate my kids, all right? So who's laughing now? <laughs> now, I say this in jest, but in reality, if you immerse yourself into another culture, you know, if you live long enough in a particular culture, you gradually start to behave like the people from that culture. And it's also true of us as Christians. So let us focus on being in Christ. That is, let us embrace that new culture. And the more we focus on Christ, in other words, the more we live in that culture, the more we are transformed into the same image. Just like me now, you know, shooting from the hips, calling people by their first name. So the more we are transformed into that image, all right, and we will go from strength to strength. So if you're here today and you're struggling with sin or you feel, um, I'm not sure how much of a Christian I am um, because I don't do Christian stuff, it doesn't come naturally to me. Uh, please be encouraged that Jesus knows what you're going through. Okay? He said, come to me. Those of you that are burdened and heavy laden, he said, I will give you rest. The important thing is for us to go to Christ. And don't worry if you think, oh yes, I do the same thing and the cycle just keeps repeating itself. That's okay, as long as you keep coming back to Jesus. That's what matters for now. Because otherwise, if you don't come back to Jesus, you'll be lost forever. So the fact that you have that sort of feeling, that sort of um, uh, 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 attitude of coming back to Jesus Christ, that shows that you're still connected to him. And it's important that we don't lose that. So please be encouraged by that today, all right? And let that spur you on to focusing on being in Christ and, of course, showing hospitality to others, however insignificant that might be. So very quickly, we move on to um, the, um, ten, the parable of the ten virgins. And I'm going to summarize very quickly. Of course, in the Jewish custom in those days, you know, um, 
the wedding ceremony was something that involves three stages, the, um, be, the be, be, betrothal, the engagement, and of course, the wedding ceremony itself. So what usually happens is that once uh, 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 the bride is betrothed to the bridegroom, the bridegroom then goes back to his father's house to prepare a chamber, okay? And that usually will take a year or, or, or more. And then he returns to come and claim his bride. Now, the time of his return is usually unknown, okay? So when he goes, does all he needs to do, he comes back. And there's a, a trumpeting and also a shouting that takes place to alert the bride of the impending visit of the husband. So we see in this verse here that um, the, hands, the handmaids, of course, went out to escort the bridegroom in a wedding procession to the, um, to the house of the bride. So all the betrothal has already taken place here. So probably at this point, the groom was on the way back. But of course, there was a delay. There was a delay. And this is not unusual in those days. So, you know, so there's this sort of psychological contract that says, you know, delay expected. All right? So the account we see in verses 2 to 13 paints that sort of interesting picture for us. And that's the picture of two distinct types of people, the wise and the foolish. Now remember, both of them, all the ten handmaids, the wise and the foolish, the five of each, they were both selected, all right, to escort the groom. Both went out to meet the bridegroom. Both had lamps for light. Both slept and woke up after the call. Both trimmed their lamps. Both expected to be in the wedding banquet. However, we see a distinction between them in their attitude and commitment towards the responsibility that they've been given. And the responsibility is escort, escort, all right? The bridegroom and this is a reflection of their different ways of being so one group took the responsibility seriously all right and was prepared but the other did not and was unprepared if we move on then to the parable of the um, three servants and the bags of gold here we see we're told of the story of you know three servants who were entrusted with a varying amount of their master's wealth. One was given five talents, one was given two talents, and one was given one talent. And of course, they all expected to, you know, they were all expected to be profitable. Now, this is also very true of us because um, we're called to be witnesses, all right? Um, and some of us are called to be witnesses in the deadliest of places. Some are called to be witnesses in peaceful places each according to our ability. Now, regardless of where we are or how much burden we are called to bear, we are called to be fruitful in that which we are called to do. So all three were entrusted with the master's wealth. All three knew what their masters expected of them. And of course, as evidence would suggest, that the master did not give them any specific instructions on what to do with the bags of gold. They instinctively knew what they had to do because there's a psychological contract. Again, two distinct people. Here. One was profitable because they were good and faithful, and the other did nothing and was unprofitable because they were wicked and lazy. So we see that expression here, by their fruits. By their fruits you shall know them. In conclusion, throughout this chapter, we are drawn to the distinction between the two groups of people, like it or not. And these two groups have plenty in common. They have the same knowledge, they have the same expectation, as, as is true in any Christian community. But we know that these two groups of people behaved differently. We have shown that they are not actually the same people because they were on that different cultures, although they lived within the same community. It was the way that they acted that determined which way of being they belonged to, who they felt they were, what they felt was their responsibility, and their commitment to that responsibility. So if we're to sum up the entire chapter, this is what I believe we're being encouraged on.
to be wise. Jesus is coming, and we need to be wise in waiting on, upon him. What are you doing while Jesus Christ is coming? Being fruitful as faithful servants, are we being profitable whilst our king is coming back? Be hospitable, are we showing hospitality? Because this is very, very important to Jesus. Okay, and that's why you'll be having that conversation with us at that judgment day. Don't forget, as Paul has instructed, don't forget. And of course, all of this is only possible if we have our being in Christ. Paul said, we all with open faces beholding as in a mirror the face of our Lord Jesus Christ are transformed into that same image. So the more you look, the more you become. So let us all, as diverse as we are, be part of that Christ culture. Let us focus on, on, on being in Christ. Seek first the kingdom and everything else will fall in place.